continue with the uh, case study uh, discussion on Hungarian politics since 1990, um, focusing on uh, main issues, of course, uh, elections, parties, and so on. So, uh, what do we know about uh, what happens in 1989-1990 uh, in Hungary? Well, one thing we know for, uh, is that, um, just like in Poland and in the Czech Republic, the, <coughs> the, the revolution, right, the, that uh, the changes in 1989 were uh, peaceful, were negotiated um, between the opposition and the uh, reformist branch of the communists. Uh, who collaborated in making this, uh, this peaceful uh, transition. Now, one thing that is uh, different uh, between, there's a significant difference between uh, uh, Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic, <coughs> or at least to a degree, is that in Hungary uh, the opposition, the civil society has been very well organized, has been organizing for quite a while. And unlike in Poland, where you know you had the solidarity, but it was outlawed at that point. In Czech Republic, you had you know smaller groups. Uh, in Hungary, you already had the civic groups that have been organizing for quite a while, and that have um, developed their own uh, individual uh, ideological identity. So instead of having one opposition group, uh, you had actually several already, which themselves had to negotiate <coughs> between themselves. To reach a common position in the negotiation with the with the with the communist government, with the well, reform communist branch of the communist government. But that's an interesting thing because then when you have <coughs> the the first elections and the next elections, these uh, already organized opposition groups will have already a, a specific ideological profile or at least a specific uh, you know uh, political goals that were would be different. Unlike in Poland or the Czech Republic, where you had you would have great big blocks of uh, opposition groups united by only one thing, opposition to the regime. So that, that you will see that happen. Okay, so um, before we go into seeing uh, what, what happens um, you know, in the elections, let's, let's review the, the Hungarian political system what can, and the state. Right? The state, uh, what do we know about Hungary as a state? Well, because of uh, the historical events that we have covered in the previous sections, and especially the Treaty of Trianon after World War One, we know that historical Hungary, the historical state, has lost about two thirds of its, of its territory, which resulted into a much smaller uh, uh, Hungary uh, that Hungarian state, rather, right? Uh, that is uh, because it's smaller, it is also very homogeneous ethnically, right? But it also means that. Uh, uh, it, the, the, the downside of the other side of the of the issue uh, is that uh, there is a large population of ethnic Hungarians on the territory of uh, other uh, neighboring uh, states, and you have maps of Central and Eastern Europe after uh, 1989, where these uh, ethnic the distribution of ethnic minorities is shown, and that's in the previous uh, section. Uh, let's look at the map of uh, Hungary. Um, that is, yeah. it's a map of Hungary, right? And uh, well, it's, again, this is one third of what it was before World War One. At a certain point in World War Two, again, it expanded and then it contracted again. So very homogeneous. But that also means, as I said, that there is a large population of ethnic Hungarians, so members of the Hungarian nation, which is defined ethnically, which are on, live on the, in the neighboring states. So that's, a, that's an important issue. Okay, so uh, fairly homogeneous uh, population, about 9, 9 million, 10 million, in, within this, these borders of, of the state, right? Again, the Hungarians make a different, differentiate, uh, just like Polish, right, between the Membership in the Hungarian nation, which is, and they calculate around 14, 15 million around the world, I'm not sure it's that much. Uh, and uh, then the, the, the size of the population of the Hungarian state, right, which is about 10 million, as I was saying. So, so the state then, it will be, being so uh, relatively small and homogenous, um, uh, the state will, uh, with, with few um, ethnic minorities and also mostly a flat territory, it's normal, it is uh, to be expected that the state will be unitary. Yes, it is a unitary state. Uh, so not federal, why would it be, right? Uh, if it would have remained with the historical uh, you know, borders, then it probably federal would have been the only way, or 
attempting to assimilate the other ethnic minorities. Remember the problems Hungary had, that the Hungarian state had, the Hungarian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire had in the 19th century and their attempts to assimilate their ethnic minorities, which formed about 45% of that that territory of that Hungarian state. Okay, so state is unitary, um, so the political system. Uh, Hungary um, has a typical, really typical parliamentary uh, system. And uh, the parallels that you will see, not by chance, are with Germany. Uh, and there will be many similarities with the German political system. Again, my you know, referencing of the sources of uh, political systems when, uh, when, the, when the political transition is um, endeavored after 1999, what will be the sources based on which, by reference to which, uh, these countries will establish their political systems, right? Um, and we talked about these facts. Well, one of the things, you know, in terms of contemporary influences for Hungary, the, the major contemporary, uh, an ongoing contemporary influence uh, for Hungarian politics and political culture is, uh, is Germany. It, it harkens back to very good relationships uh, with Germany also uh, historically. Okay, so uh, the political system will be the typical uh, parliamentary uh, political system. Uh, it is, now, if we were to guess, is it bicameral or unicameral? Well, the right guess would be unicameral, because in a smaller homogeneous country, why would you have a bicameral? Well, we don't know why Czech Republic has a bicameral system, right? Uh, uh, parliament uh, legislature. In Hungary, it is indeed unicameral. So, being a parliamentary system, this is the, the, the core of the system is the parliament, which is called the house of the country in Hungarian, but it's translated usually as the National Assembly. In my documents on Canvas, I, I use both interchangeably. I say parliament, I use or National Assembly is the same thing because it's, you know, it's one house. Okay, which is directly elected by the population, the, as in other parliamentary systems, the only institution directly elected by the population. Uh, and we're going to talk about the electoral system in a second. Right? So, unicameral parliamentary system. Being a parliamentary system, obviously then you will have a prime minister who is a head of the executive and a cabinet, who, which cabinet and, uh, that will be formed, government that will be formed after each election, uh, right based on which party or coalition, in the multi-party system is going to be a coalition, has the majority in the parliament. Then you'll have a president who is typical for semi-presidential systems, uh, is only head of state, so more, mostly formal and ceremonial and symbolic uh, roles. In this case, unlike, for example, in the Czech Republic, right, which has its weirdness, right, that we talked about, this is a pure parliamentary system. The president is formal, ceremonial, symbolic. It really resembles a lot if you have studied, or if you will study, uh, the German political system. So, in many ways, this system resembles the so-called chance chancellor democracy that Germany has, meaning that the PM is truly the heart of the system. It is truly the most important uh, policymaker, the most important actor in the system. Okay, um, but remember that being a multi-party system, the cabinet will be um, um, uh, made of, uh, uh, you know, representatives of those parties that are part of the coalition. So. You know, in the cabinet, you will see the distribution of positions will reflect this coalition, right? Um, and the PM will usually be, obviously, the leader of the largest party that won uh, on this in this winning coalition. Okay, uh, becoming because it is a parliamentary system, and the president is only head of state, while the prime minister is fully head of executive. Uh, how will the president be elected? It cannot be elected by the population because that will push it towards a different sort of a system, right? That it can't have direct mandate from the population. So the president is elected by the only other body that can elect it, which is the parliament. But this is danger would be dangerous um, <coughs> if only a majority would be needed, right? Because then the president will reflect would reflect the political distribution of the parliament. In a parliamentary system, the president is supposed to be above politics, right? Representing the ongoing reality of the state, the legal background, backbone of the state, and so on. Indeed. So, the, the elections for the president happen every five years, uh, and they re the, the election requires, uh, in order for the president to be elected, two-thirds of the parliament needs to elect it, right? So, it's elected by the parliament, 
two thirds, however, which means clearly that it, 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 it requires a coalition that goes across, widely across the, the um, ideological uh, uh, balance of the of the parliament. Right? Usually, you'll have a small majority of of left or right. Two thirds means that you need to compromise of much more, or at least it used to mean that until 2010. So a super majority, like a qualified majority, is needed to elect the president for, as I said, five years. The parliament is elected for four years. Now uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, electoral system. In that uh, lecture on electoral systems, uh, a third model that, I, that is presented in the lecture is, which is neither PR nor SMB FPP, is MMPR. And MMPR again is the model that, guess what? It is the model used in Germany. Um, and it is a combination, and uh, again, watch the video of the electoral systems to know how it works. But the essence is that each voter has two votes, and one of them is an SMB vote, and the other one is a PR vote. And which means that each voter is part of two districts. I live here, and then I'm part of two districts. The, my, my SMB district, which, which produces one individual seat, and my PR district, which produces a list, right? Several seats, right? Uh, several seats, right? And in this, so I, I have two votes. Here I vote for an individual, here I vote for a party, right? Which proposes a list, right? Again, the electoral system is described in the election. So what this does is it combines both uh, individual accountability, the individual connection with the representative of your smaller district, with uh, party consistency, right? You vote for a party, you vote for a certain ideology at the regional level. Now, here's the, uh, what this produces. So, it, it kind of is a system quite popular in, 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 in to a good degree, is that it, is, it uh, tries to take the, the good parts from both systems, from the SMB and from the PR, right? Uh, uh, to take a proportionality, the democratic dimension from the PR system, but also to maintain the link with the individual representative uh, through the SMD uh, vote. So this is why it's popular. And uh, until 2000, uh, what was it, 2012 or thereabouts, this was the electoral system. Uh, uh, it's, it's called MMPR because it's mixed member proportional. Mixed member meaning that you it produces both members elected through single member districts and members produced, produced through, uh, through uh, multi member districts in the PR vote. But it's also PR meaning that the results overall are proportional, are balanced out. This is why the electoral system, and I posted a, um, a document explaining both the previous and the current electoral system, because this will change. Um, uh, the, until 2000, what was it, 12 or 13, um, uh, the um, overall, overall, uh, for the entire parliament, the percentage of seats acquired by each party was basically reflected the percentage of votes, which is that overall it was balanced to be proportional. This is why it was kind of complex. Um, but and, and and also in 2013, uh, the uh, SMB part of the vote was SMB2 ballot, which is strange. Was SMB2 ballot, and, and so not SMB FPP, what's the difference, right? SMB FPP, right, is everybody votes for an individual, and whoever gets most of the votes wins, right? Most of the votes means that you don't need to have a majority, right? So if, if Jimmy here gets 40% and the others get less, he gets the entire vote, meaning the entire the one seat, right? So that inflates the majority. That is the system that you have in the US, right? However, in the, that wasn't the case in the electoral system in Hungary before 2000, before recently. Uh, it was an SMD two ballot, meaning that when you voted for that one to, to get the, whoever will occupy that one seat that came from that single member district, it was actually a two ballot. In a two ballot system, uh, you one you have one vote <coughs> on a Sunday uh, for um, a regular vote, right? And then if nobody gets fifty percent in that vote, 
Two weeks later, you have a second ballot, this is why I call it second ballot, in which only the first two from the first ballot move on. Right? So here, everybody votes for a candidate. The two candidates that obtain the most votes in the first round, given that nobody obtains the majority, get to the second round, and of course, in the second round, someone will have the majority. When you divide the pie to two, someone will get the more than 50% more. Most, more than probably, right? So the point of the SMB to ballot, this is the electoral system used, by the way, in France, right? in the regular elections, is to make sure that whoever gets that seat from the district represents the majority of the population, not just the plurality, thus mediating one of the problems with the SMB FPP, which is an artificial majority, is wasted votes, because it can happen that someone occupies, uh, you know, this wins the seat with less than the majority, so basically most of the people in the district are not represented. So that was the idea. So half of it was SMB to ballot, and the other half was proportion, meaning that parties will put lists, will, will propose, well, let's say there will be 10 seats in the district, parties will propose you know, lists of candidates to occupy. It's a typical PR. Now this was changed. This was changed in, in, uh, in 2000, as I said, 2012, 13, whatever it was, basically before the last election, which was in 2004. So that's the essence. That it, the current system is no longer MMPR, so it's no longer a mixed member that overall is proportional. Right? It is actually MM, we can call it MMM. Or we can call it an MM, uh, well, let's call it MMM. It's mixed member majoritarian. Because it combines an SMD FPP with a PR system. List system. But one, that's one thing. So here you will have a simple, like in the US, a vote for an individual in the district, whoever gets the most wins from one round, which is nothing extraordinary. Right? And then you'll have a PR uh, uh, district, so the same idea, you're a member of two districts, you have two votes, right? One district produces one seat, and the large district produces uh, PR. Only that the PR dimension is national now. So that kind of eliminates certain smaller parties. The PR that I mentioned previously was regional, so each region produced you know, its own PR list before. No, now it's national. So there are two votes, one in your district for your individual representative, and the other one is nationally for party lists, and that's PR. And overall, the results are not balanced proportionally. Right? So clearly, this one this produces is, a, is, a, is an a enhancement of the uh, of the, um, so the, the percentage of votes will not be reflected in, uh, exactly in the percentage of seats obtained, but it will be inflated, right? So uh, it, will, it will be disproportionate. But that's the system, for example, right? That's what one of the effects of SMD FPP. That's what happens in the US, that's what happens in the UK. Uh, one, that's one of the problems with SMD FPP, right? That the percentage of seats does not reflect the percentage of votes, right? You, you, uh, uh, a party can obtain a large or wide majority in the parliament without obtaining the actual majority of votes in the entire country. That's SMB FPP. Because in SMB FPP, you can win with 40% uh, of the vote. If everybody else gets less, you win the seat. If that happens in every single district in the country, and uh, in this SMB FPP based system, like the US or the UK, it, if that happens everywhere in the country, it means that you have obtained 40% in every single district, so 40% of the entire population have, and you have won all the, all the seats, 100%. Right? That's a possibility, theoretically, right? That with 40% in every district, you win 100% of the seats in the parliament. That's the problem in SMB. Now, so today you have an MMM, a mixed member majoritarian sort of, sort of a thing, in which one half is SMD FPP in the district and the other one is PR nationally and overall it's not balanced to be proportional. That differs from the German model which overall is balanced to be proportional. That's important to understand and to keep in mind. I mean, there's nothing outrageous about the system, right? There's nothing outrageous about the system. Again, established democracies like the US and the UK have a pure SMD FPP which is definitely not proportional. It has no, the percentage of seats has nothing to do with the percentage of votes. You just have to win each individual district. So, you know. Anyway, um, so that's the electoral system today, and we'll see why this is, this is relevant. Even the previous one, the MMPR, uh, was slightly, you know, 
it inflated the majority. But this one inflates even more, uh, meaning that uh, the percentage of votes will not be reflected in exactly the percentage of seats. Okay, but that being said, uh, let's go back to a little bit to the political system. So the president, what does he do? The, pre the role of the president is to represent the state, and this is, will be reflected in the type of uh, profiles of people who got appointed, uh, to got elected to the position of the president. The PM is the most powerful policy maker in the system, the parliament the only elected body in the system, and so on. So, and the PM depends on the majority in the parliament and the cabinet. Okay. So the president, the president signs laws, he has certain functions which your book uh, uh, references quickly. Uh, the, the, the chapter in the book is fairly okay, is, you know, fairly okay. The problem is it's very short and it's not, not, it's kind of breezy, to put it bluntly. It doesn't go into the, the some of the important issues that, that, that characterize Hungarian politics. So uh, there are problems with this chapter, but it, what it gives you is solid, but it misses a lot, let me put it that way. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, uh, all, all sources have limitations, hence you have to use them in, in a sort of you know, complementary fashion. Um, okay, so um, the president signs laws, right? But also has some attributions that are relevant. And your book mentions this, uh, that the first president, um, Arpad Guns, um, used, the, for example, the ability to appoint certain people to certain state institutions like the t uh, state TV station, or to remove them, um, uh, use them to kind of depoliticize those institutions, so kind of maintain the balance. And that is the, the core duty of the president in the parliamentary system, is to maintain the functioning of the system, to maintain the democratic balance within the, the, the entire state, right? He's the guardian of the, of the state in many ways. Right? But it doesn't have many powers, but it kind of, you know, uh, that is the mission, so whatever tools the president has would be, in that case, the president used it to do that. Um, so the president uh, has some power, some, some uh, role in certain appointments, uh, but uh, he, or the president also needs to sign all legislation that is passed by parliament, and obviously most legislation will come from the executive, as typically in parliamentary systems, will be passed in the legislature and then will go to be signed by the president. Can he veto? He cannot really veto. He can send back a bill for reconsideration to the parliament and that is again a moral gesture, right? Something needs to be, clearly there needs to be something wrong and usually something wrong has to do with constitutionality, with it not being kosher, so to speak, right? Uh, again, the role of the president of maintaining the balance of the system, the constitutionality, the, the democratic nature of the system and the functioning of the state. Right, so he can send it back to the parliament, or he can send it to the constitutional court for review, and that is an interesting, that is an interesting uh, aspect. Sending back, sending, sending back to the constitutional court for review, um, about which we will talk in a second. Okay, the prime minister um, is usually the head of the majority party in the coalition. He um, gets appointed uh, just like a cabinet after the election. Um, and usually it's, as I said, the, the head of the majority party. Uh, the, president, the, the prime minister is the major engine of policy, uh, helped by the fact that he has the support of the majority coalition. He appoints the ministers who usually are from the major parties, of course, as I said. Right? That's typical for a parliamentary system. The, the, the cabinet will affect the composition of the coalition. Um, and the Prime Minister is there until he has this support. Can the legislature, the, the Parliament, the National Assembly remove the Prime Minister and the Cabinet? Yes, it can. Through, again, you see the German correspondence, um, uh, and also you have encountered this in the case of Poland, through a constructive vote of no confidence. And remember, a constructive vote of no confidence is different from a vote of no confidence by the fact that the parliament can only remove the premium and the cabinet if it has ready, basically, if it is able to, to appoint another cabinet and prime minister instead. And that makes it harder to just remove, create stability, create stability, makes it harder to remove the prime minister and the, 
uh, and, the, and the cabinet just, you know, because this coalition has fallen apart, because another majority coalition needs to form instead. And so it pushes for stability. Okay. Um, so that's, that's uh, basically it. another important aspect, perhaps, uh, because, especially because of the more recent you know, developments in the last, say, 10 years, is that the, the parliament um, is also a constitutional, constitution-making body. Uh, meaning that um, the two-thirds dimension, the two-thirds aspect is key. That the two-thirds of the parliament can elect the president, two-thirds of the parliament can also amend the constitution. Okay? Uh, it's a supermajority, you know, like who would think that you would ever have, you know, if, I mean, obviously, normally speaking, in a multi-party system, you will have a coalition just to form a majority, let alone a supermajority of two-thirds, which will, would clearly normally involve parties from the entire spectrum, so forcing a compromise, so forcing the issue beyond politics, right? So it's important to keep this in mind. It's also important to keep in mind that actually Hungary never passed, unlike Poland or the Czech Republic, the Czech Republic in for the obvious reason that it was, you know, the Czech Republic was formed in 1992, um, but uh, neither Poland nor the, uh, the both Poland and Czech Republic passed the constitution in the 90s. Not Hungary. Hungary just kind of patched this and that because uh, the parties could never really agree. Could never really agree to uh, uh, to do this in the 1990s. Um, and so they just patched the amendments, the communist constitution, actually. You know, removed the awful parts, the blatant parts, and then just added, you know, uh, parts. Well, clearly this, this created dissatisfaction, right? Uh, and this will be mandated uh, basically in 2011, a uh, few years ago, with a brand new constitution, and we'll see how important this is. Okay, so we talked about the president, we talked about the prime minister, the cabinet, and the legislature, the, the unicameral uh, uh, legislature. Uh, let's um, say a few words about the, the judicial system. Uh, which um, has, uh, at least right, right now, and again I posted links to this, has differentiates between the highest court of appeal, which is called the Curia today, and a constitutional court. The Curia, or the, um, again, you have the links on Canvas, which is the highest court of appeals, is the highest court of appeals in civil, criminal, whatever, administrative cases. So all the types of judicial cases is the highest court of appeals. Curia. C-U-R-I. But the constitutional court is something else. You saw that also in the case of, uh, for example, Poland and so on. It's typical, you know, uh, only in the U.S. it's unique that it's all down to the Supreme Court. The constitutional court has a separate uh, uh, role, right? And that is the role of being the guardian of the constitution, the guardian of the functioning of the, of the system. And it has become uh, actually a very powerful and important uh, body, mostly through its activism, through its, through its um, uh, very uh, poignant presence, especially in the 90s. It has developed a sort of, a, just like in the US, the Supreme Court has developed its own attributions, the Supreme Court has defined in the early 19th century, as it was a bit, that um, it has the power of judicial review. It just gave itself its power. Similarly, actually, the Constitutional Court in Hungary has kind of developed this power of, uh, of um, interpreting laws, and um, I'm not going to go into detail, but it has, it has developed a very powerful presence of uh, um, being able to, to uh, to act uh, to preserve the constitution in a very activist manner, in a very activist manner, and uh, it's also in, in, uh, in notable that uh, in Hungary the constitutional court can act both, just like in Poland, if uh, I recall correctly, the constitutional court can uh, act both uh, immediately after the law has passed. The constitutional court can, uh, for example, the president can send a bill. To the constitutional court to see if it is constitutional, right? which, for example, the U.S. doesn't exist, and also post facto, which means after a bill has passed and it has become a law, cases can be brought to the constitutional court to, to, to check the constitutionality. That's how it works in the U.S., right? So uh, this happens also in many other European countries that the constitutional court can check before 
the bill becomes law. So before the president signs, he can ask for the con uh, a review of its constitutionality. Or after it has become law, the, the case can come to the constitutional court. Anyway, it is a presence and it is a very important presence. Okay. So let's talk about politics in Hungary uh, starting in the, in the 90s, right? So let's review which are the major actors in Hungary in the 1990s and we will do that by looking at the elections of, uh, actually, of the, the 1990 elections. Okay, the first three elections. And as you see, just in Poland, like in Poland and in the Czech Republic, the first three elections have, you know, thrown the communists aside, right? But unlike in Poland and the Czech Republic uh, and so on, here you already have, as I said, different, very specific, specific very well-developed, distinct uh, opposition political groups. And let's identify them. There's the Hungarian Democratic Forum, NDF, which was more center-right, more, um, well, all well, of them were sort, sort of center-right, but more traditionalist, more uh, nationally, well, patriotic, let's say, national-oriented, uh, less inclined for, uh, towards liberal economic reforms, you know, less inclined towards a wild, uh, uh, you know, free market uh, shock therapy and so on. Right? Then you have the, this is the first, the major one. The second one, major one, was the Alliance of Free Democrats, SDS, which was more liberal in the traditional sense, right? Again, classical liberalism. If you don't know what that means, look at the political ideologies lecture, please. Because uh, we need to use these terms on the same, with the same meanings. So, classical liberalism, which means individual freedoms and also free market oriented, right? So that's, uh, you know, classical liberalism. Um, and then, and more urban, this is more, you know, traditionalist, this is more western, uh, urban, civic, and so on. Uh, then you have the Independent Smallholders Party, which is a party actually from before communism, it was the biggest party which won the, the last three elections in Hungary before communism and they were pushed aside and persecuted and imprisoned by the communists. So an agrarian party of the interwar kind, right? Then you have the KDMP, which is the Christian Democratic People's Party, also a pre-war party. Remember where did parties come from, right? We talked about these sources, either pre-war or opposition groups uh, or, or matching Western models, right? or reform communists, and these are the Hungarian Socialist Party, which were the reform communists, which are truly reform communists. As I said, they participated in the whole transition, uh, and then they moved to the well, true reform, whatever that means, right? But clearly not the hardliners, right? And they've become the typical social democratic party after 1989, just like in Poland and Czech Republic, and so on. And then there's an interesting part called Fidesz, and Fidesz is, is translated as, but we, everybody uses the acronym, but it's actually an acronym, right, for the Young Democrats um, uh, Association or uh, Alliance, right, so uh, Young Democrats Association, but everybody knows it, it's Fidesz, which were actually, yes, young people, uh, students basically, um, uh, who uh, were very, you know, urban, um, liberal in a classical sense, uh, fiercely anti-communist and much more radical anti-communist than, than uh, these uh, two in many ways, uh, and anti-Soviet and so on. So you know, this sort of an urban, civic, liberal, uh, sort of a central right, whatever, uh, but also strongly, you know, for freedom of the nation and so on. Okay, so that's Venus. It was so much the Young Democrats Alliance, that actually there was a rule that nobody over 35, which would exclude me, nobody over, <laughs> for sure, uh, nobody over 35 uh, 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 was allowed to, uh, to, uh, to be a member of the party at that point. So literally that was the young people's uh, organization. Yeah? And obviously the meaning here was, you know, the old generation has been implicitly corrupt by being part of the past of the communist past, so we want a new thing. So it's an interesting thing. That's in 1990. Okay, and these are the major factors. And notice, you know, again, I left all the parties that ran because just like in all the other Central Eastern European parties, uh, countries, you will have the euphoria of the democracy immediately in the first elections. You will have many, many parties running. But in Hungary, it will, it will be unlike in Poland, where this resulted into a complete fractioning of the vote as well, which reflects the tradition of, poly, uh, of the 
of the uh, fracturing of the Polish political culture, you know, even going back in the 19th, 18th century. Remember, the fall of Poland in the 18th century was because the nobles could not agree and could not agree to elect a king, right? So this fracturing of the political society goes very much back in Polish history, just like in French history. Here you have some major currents, but it's fairly stable, and that will be one of the characteristics of, of Hungarian politics until the end of the 2000s, right? Remember that end of 2000s, 2010, as I mentioned in the Czech and Polish uh, video lectures, that it seems to be a watershed moment this 2010. Uh, that will also happen here. But anyway, coming back, fairly stable. And actually, by, until the middle of 2000s, end of 2000s, it will be kind of a two-pole thing, more or less, a two-pole thing. And, and which will kind of, and, and government, um, the, 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 the parties in power will switch after each election. Okay, so the first election is won by the, obviously by the opposition, but unlike in Poland, not the entire opposition. So it would be the, the more traditionalist opposition, the Democratic Forum, and the pre-war parties uh, who reformed, who will actually form a coalition. Uh, at this point, the Hungarian parliament has 386 members. This also will change with the new constitution. So many things will change after 2010, as we'll see. Just like the electoral system. Okay, so uh, they will uh, form the government, not the Free Democrats, because these two forces were kind of in rival, rivals by this time, right? But, but, um, it was still the watershed, of the, the important election that removed the Communists, right? The first free election. So there was still this sense of us opposition versus the Communists, right? And which, which also, um, and that reflected itself in how they divided, okay, we, these parties formed the coalition, the, the coalition government, but they agreed to give, so to speak, the presidency to the other opposition party, the Free Democrats. And that's how they will get the presidency. And you see, um, so they will divide the functions in the state, you know, they will have the actual governance and they will, will give. Give means what? We will vote for your candidate for the presidency. That's the idea. For two thirds, you need many parties to agree to vote for a candidate. But well, they agreed to give, to, 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 to accept the candidate of the other party which was not in the coalition government. Again, still the opposition, right, was in power. One got the presidency, the rest got the actual power. Okay. Uh, this is also important uh, as a parenthesis because I, I mentioned that we discussed the fact that the establishment of the political system will have to do with a specific context. And in this specific context, notice that you know, uh, uh, it could have happened differently. Let's say that, uh, just like in the Czech Republic, they have a harbor sort of a personality, which they didn't have, okay? One, some of one of these towering personalities, or like uh, Vanessa or whatever, they did not have that. And the president that was, um, the person who became president was, a, was an opposition member, a writer, intellectual, right, uh, a moral authority, but it was a sort of an, Afterthought, wasn't it? It was sort of okay. We're going to give you this position. Clearly, it wasn't something okay. We're going to give you this position, and we're going to give it to someone who is a towering personality, which will overshadow the rest. No, right? Clearly not the same. The power is here, and the, the person who became a prime minister was a, an important, not of the size of Valesa or Habe, but an important, powerful personality. So the point is that when the, the system was set up and it started functioning. There was a sort of a tug of war a little bit between the prime minister and the president in terms of, you know, turf, meaning who will, which way do we push this system? But clearly it was the prime minister, clearly it was the parties in power, clearly it was this side that, that, that carried the day. So when they defined the whole system, it was, again, with the German model in, in mind, it was, it is basically a chance of democracy, it is a parliamentary democracy on the German, and now also, yeah, British model in which the PM is the most powerful and the president is sort of a above politics, moderate, you know, intellectual, moral, legal uh, authority. And that's, that will be the model also followed uh, later. It also gives stability to the system in many ways because unlike in the semi-presidential model, there is no talk of war, uh, you know, between the, this side and this side. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, uh, Fidesz also is not part of the government in the first uh, election. Okay. So let's uh, let's go to the 
Uh, second election, uh, so the president is elected by the parliament in 1990. 1994, parliamentary elections, what happens here? What happens in between 1990 and 1994? Well, one of the problems that happens is that the first uh, opposition government, of course, as in Poland as in the Czech Republic, will fail. Will fail inevitably no matter what they do, because they cannot live up to those heightened expectations. It also fails in Hungary because they actually did not want to push towards radical reforms. They didn't jump into a shock therapy as they did in Poland and then also in the Czech Republic. So actually, they dragged their feet. And, you know, those problems of transition, those challenges that we have discussed, were there inevitably. You have to tackle them. You have to tackle them. Whether you want it or not, just pushing them, uh, you know, postponing them. But remember, this was a coalition of traditionalists. Uh, they weren't keen on, you know, just throwing the, 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 bus, the people under the bus of, of shock therapy. Okay? And that didn't solve uh, anything. Furthermore, the, the first Prime Minister, Anton Yozhev, he actually died while in office. Died while in office uh, by, uh, because of illness, of cancer. So actually he did not, he will not leave out his mandate. Uh, so that also complicated the situation, obviously. Still, the, you know, there was a, another Prime Minister was appointed. The thing went on, the system was very stable, uh, as your book also mentions. So next, as you see, all of the elections will take place at the scheduled time, every four years, which is different from the other countries we have studied, so stability there. Uh, 1994, um, you have the next election. Which, where you have that normal reversal, like who's going to win, the reform counts. But just like in uh, 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 the other two cases uh, that we have studied, uh, here you have a case where the, the Social Democrats, although they could govern alone, will not govern alone. They will enter uh, into a coalition with the Alliance of Free uh, Democrats. Uh, although they have the majority, Notice, right? Notice, uh, um, they have 209 of the 386. It's a multi-party system in which a party gets the majority. That's, MMPR still was sort of inflated a little bit, the, 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 the results, right? Because they got, what, 33% of the votes here, 31% here, and 50% of the seats. So still inflated, right? Um, but they enter into the coalition with the Alliance of Free Democrats, you know, which was an opposition party from, you know, urban, civic, and so on, liberal, for many reasons, right, for many reasons. One, because they, these, the three Democrats, have been already the opposition party in the previous parliamentary mandate to the Democratic Forum, to the previous government. So, and the fact that MDF and SDS have been, you know, on different sides of, of, on, of issues, right? So within the opposition there have developed, you know, sort of currents, right? And these currents were opposed. So that's one reason why the uh, Alliance of Free Democrats, who obviously wanted to get into government, you know, accepted to join. The, the, the Social Democrats, this was a good way for them to show, look, we're making an alliance with the former opposition, anti-communist opposition, we're not communist. And indeed, they weren't anymore. In fact, this is the government that will actually introduce shock therapy. Because that's another thing that we noticed in previous, uh, we saw in, uh, in previous examples, Poland, for example, that that the social democrats uh, will actually have no qualm in many cases to become very liberal in the sense uh, of economic and to be very ardent for privatization and so on. It also happened that many of them were the winners of these privatizations uh, and so on. So anyway, so there is this alliance that forms, which is sort of unnatural, right, between reform communists and a major opposition group, uh, right, uh, only, what, five years after the, the whole changes, right? But again, now they're social democrats, and it's very liberal, and it's free market, and it's let's privatize and whatever. And indeed, shock therapy is introduced, and again, just like everywhere else, it's going to come with lots of suffering, and the population will be less inclined to, to accept it, less inclined than in the Czech Republic, less inclined in, in Poland, Partially, and your book makes this point, because they have been used to living fairly well. In Hungary, under communism, it was the famous goulash communism. It was a looser, looser, uh, you know, kind of a, a nicer, not nice, the communists, but the level of li life uh, standards were, were pretty good, relatively speaking, relaxed and so on. They were people who were used to this and expected from, the, from these changes just better. Well, shock therapy did came with, obviously, unemployment and all those social costs we have discussed. So, um, and plus the tensions in the, in, the, in the coalition will be natural, right? These are 
you know, right liberals, these are more left liberals, meaning uh, they are uh, the social democrats, you know, have this still the social part and so on. So it will be a complicated thing. So, for example, the, 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 the Minister of Finance who introduced the shock therapy will be from the Free Democrats. Because of the public backlash, the Social Democrats, reform, former ex-reform communists, will actually pull back and they will change some of the ministries and will appoint some labor unions and so on which will enrage the social democrats who wanted to push with the free reform and shock therapy so there will be tremendous tensions also within uh, the, 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 the coalition uh, government furthermore, um, let's uh, note here that the fact that the, 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 the free democrats, the alliance of uh, free democrats, the SDS um, the fact that they entered into a coalition with, with the Social Democrats was uh, was actually, uh, they were noticed, they were uh, quite popular, they got, they, became, they were the second, uh, they obtained the second most votes uh, right in the country, uh, a large number, almost double than the Hungarian Democratic Forum, so you know, they got a lot, right, in terms of the former opposition parties. But this is the last time they will get such results because there will be a huge stamp, negative stamp put on them because in between the, the, the two rounds of the SNB vote, they kind of, the rhetoric was that they would not enter into a, a, an alliance, into a coalition with the, with the former communists, with the reform communists, with the Soviet Democrats, and yet they did. And they will never survive because this, this thing, this stigma of this thing, because still, I mean, they're legitimacy comes from came from what where came from the time of communism when they were in opposition to to the regime right doing such a thing you know obviously many people voted for them because of that voted for them because they were part of that past but they weren't the sort of the Hungarian uh, uh, form the people who have been in government didn't work out right so that will well that will be a <laughs> They will never survive this sort of a stand they will never become such a popular party after this election they will always be around maybe, you know, 10-15% uh, and so on. Okay, so anyway, um, you know, people, out, uh, people will suffer because of this shock therapy, there will be this talk of war, it's going to be kind of a mess. So in the 1998 election, the pendulum swings back, uh, and the, it's actually the uh, yet another uh, uh, center-right force that wins the election. So notice what happens. The uh, MDF, the Hungarian Dem Democratic Forum, which won the first election, uh, fell tremendously between, uh, since, you know, they were in power between 1990 and 1994, then in opposition, and continued to fall and to fall and to fall. By this time, they only obtained uh, uh, 17 seats. Uh, 17 seats uh, in the parliament, uh, they obtained zero seats in the PR uh, part, uh, zero seats in the list part, but they obtained 17 single member district vo uh, votes out of 386. I mean, tremendous falling apart. But what does this mean? Now, think of the political spectrum in, in Hungary. Why is this important? Right? So, if we were to put parties on the spectrum, although it's you know, fairly hard, you would have the on the center left, the Social Democrats at this point, right? Social Democrats, the uh, MSP, right? The, the, the Hungarian Social Party, right? Socialist Party. On the center right, uh, how should we put this? Um, perhaps something like this. You could put the, 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 the Free Democrats, meaning SDS, sort of center right here, and then would be MDF here, and further to the right you have other parties, small holders. Now the MDF disappears, and what do you see here? There's a huge void on the center right. Which sort of center right? On that traditionalist, you know, sort of nationalist, sort of more conservative, in the traditional sense, in the classical sense, party, less inclined to liberal economic reforms, to free, you know, just throwing the free market and people and so on, right? There's a huge void. And guess what? Into that void steps Fidesz. Into that void steps this party, 
uh, that used to be you know the young people, urban, civic, liberal actually in the sense of you know uh, traditional liberalism, and it switches towards a more conservative in the classical sense. Uh, more skeptical of you know this rash free market, more nationalistic and so on uh, uh, mold. So it steps into that and it sweeps this this side. And in fact, and since 1998, it will only grow and grow and grow. This is a, a, a fantastic move. Now uh, you know one can interpret it cynically, saying, "Oh yeah, this was a strategic move." It was arguably, you know, one could also argue that it was a move by who were getting growing up. Remember, this was the, 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 the part of young people right? at first in the 1990s. They were fresh out of the benches of the university. Well, by 1998, they were a little bit more mature. The prime minister, the, the person who become prime minister from Fidesz, Viktor Orban, at this point has 35 years, actually, ironically. Clearly, they have eliminated that rule that only people under 35 can become members of the party, right? Uh, that's what happens. Everybody gets old. Uh, but so Viktor Orban, um, who gets elected prime minister, who becomes prime minister uh, by being the head of the party uh, after this election, is 35. Uh, all of them are about this age. You start looking at things differently. Uh, this, you know, the easy anti-communism of the beginnings, uh, whatever, it's not enough anymore. And you start to anchor yourself into an ideology. And remember, most of these parties, right, were parties that were remnants of the communist and communist dilemma. So all of these parties will have to gain, to have, will have to find an ideological identity. Right? So where do you look? You look abroad, you look, uh, you look in the past, this is where you look. Right? And, and the Fidesz will shape itself an ideology that will be rooted in the Hungarian past, in the Hungarian. So they will be a sort of a conservative party that are a reflection of this, of a certain perspective on the on what is Hungary, what is, what is the Hungarian past, an interpretation of that, national cultural values, uh, patriotism, nationalism, whatever it is. Um, uh, uh, so a certain conservatism that reflects a specific Hungarian uh, history. Okay? So that's what they will anchor themselves, or redefine themselves. That's, uh, both, you know, strategically it will be a great move at that, at that point, because there was a huge opening for such a party, because the party that occupied that part of the spectrum, MDF, disappeared, right, fell, fell apart, didn't disappear completely, but it fell apart, fell, became a minor party, right? Uh, the SDS is the civic, urban, uh, liberal, sort of uh, secularist, whatever it is, um, uh, you know, neoliberal, even economically, you know, um, so that's SDS, cosmopolitan, whatever, the social democrats are social democrats, they're the reform communists at the left, we're not going to go there. So this side is, 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 is available, this side is available. And remember, understand, this is a conservatism that has no problems with, you know, it has nothing to do with the conservative, what it means, the word means, well, how it's interpreted or misinterpreted here or used here because each political system is different than political culture. You know, uh, they have no qualms in uh, using the state in service of the interests of the nation and so on and so on, and, uh, right? So we talked about this when we talked about Poland, but you kind of have a sense. Who forms the government here then? It will be this, this kind of a new center-right uh, uh, Fidesz in alliance with the remnants of MDF, really just random, random uh, some remnants of MDF, uh, with the smallholders party and with Hungarian Justice and Life Party. And these are, this was a kind of an extreme, further, further, not extreme, further to the right party, almost extremist. This was the traditional traditionalist, very traditional, kind of stuck in the past party. Right? So you kind of see what happens. Um, notice that the MDF splits here because a part of them goes with Fidesz, right? uh, which helps them take up this identity, and the part will run separately. Okay, and the Alliance of Free Democrats, you see, there it is 10%, 7.8%, 24 seats. 24 seats, less than half of what they had before. You see, as I said, they will never recover from that alliance with the social democrats. So the democrats, what's interesting about them is, you know, they're the second largest, but they will have no partner to form an alliance with um, uh, at this point, in this, after this election. So here's the spectrum in 1998, right? 
on the left, social democrats, and a variety of, of basically center right parties up to the farther right party. Okay. That's 1998. So Viktor Orban becomes prime minister, a very forceful, very strong personality. And um, uh, meanwhile, in, 2000, in 1996, 1995, uh, the president, Gertz Arpad, this president that was elected in 1990, is re-elected by the parliament again. Clearly it shows you that he was an uncontroversial figure that people kind of accepted. He is uh, over the, above the politics positioning. Then in 2000, you have, uh, since the president is elected for five years, two mandates maximum, you have a new election for the president. Ferenc Mahler is elected, um, which is going to be... Um, um, sort of a center-right uh, 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 president, uh, but it's interesting to kind of note here his, um, his background, because it tells you what the role of the president is in the parliamentary system. Franz Mahler, a legal scholar of international reputation, has worked for many international legal bodies and courts and so on. So, understand, legal scholar, right? So, you, the role of the president is to maintain, to be a guarantor, to be a or authority that makes sure that the legal framework, meaning the backbone of the state, is, remains legal, remains constitutional, remains according to the norms of democracy and so on. So that's kind of where this comes from, this position um, uh, of the president in the parliamentary system. Um, and you see that the later president will, will be someone who used to be the head of the constitutional court. What is the constitutional court? It's the institution that guarantees the, the functioning of the constitution. Electing as president someone who used to be the head of that institution gives you a sense of what this is about. Okay, but this, so, legal scholar of international rec recognition, but somewhat allied with the center, center right, by the way. So it has, he has some past in, in that, but still a uh, lot of reputation. Okay, then you have 2002 elections, which are very, very narrow, as you can see. Very, very, 386, right? Let's do the math. Uh, 188, 197, 197 seats here um, that that the uh, on one side uh, and 180, so 198 with this one, 198 seats on one side and 188 seats on the other side. So you see how narrow <laughs> uh, a majority there is. But notice what happens in this election. I told you that basically you had two polls that kind of some parties changed because it, they grew and then and, and fell a little bit like the NDF but basically two polls, right? The Social Democrats on the left and some center-right of various kinds more free market, less, more traditionalist or more urban free market and some extreme right, right? That's kind of what it was, right? You see how this poll clarifies itself gradually through the fact that uh, uh, Fidesz, what it did, as I said, was it grew and it grew. It grew and it grew uh, in a very conscious attempt to be and to become a catch-all party. Catch-all parties are these, are the staples of, uh, of multi-party systems, are those parties that cover all uh, the entire political spectrum from basically the middle to as far as they can reach. Right? In Germany, for example, is the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats. There are two major parties and there are smaller ones. In the UK, it's Labour and Tory, right? the, two major, uh, the two major parties in the heart of it. Right? And in France, it's the, whatever, uh, the major center-right godless party versus the Socialists. It's always, there are always two catch-all parties. They're called catch-all parties because through their program, through the people they recruit, through their rhetoric, they try to appeal to, first of all, to the middle, which is always more people in the middle, but also to as much as possible from the rest. Now, Fidesz, which was a very niche party, you can't invent a more niche party if the, this, uh, than the party that had the rule that nobody over 35 can uh, be a, a, a member of the party. Well, from that, Fidesz becomes uh, and moves towards becoming a, a, a catch-all party, a catch-all party on the center right. And it does this by incorporating Others say undermining, uh, destroying the smaller parties with, with which, which who allied themselves with, with them. Some would say, 
or just you know spreading their wings. And that's what happens here. Notice that the, the Fidesz runs with MDF, right? The sort of Fidesz took up the cloak of the what used to be MDF, and and almost gets a majority. Notice the attempt to get a majority. While the other two parties, uh, the, the only other two parties that remain are the Social Democrats and these Free Democrats. Free Democrats, who by this time have become a sort of a strange thing, uh, who are liberal economically, 